This video is sponsored by Coding Dojo. Okay, so now we can say Apple have officially moved away from CISC since their new ARM-based chips are clearly scalable. Although in short, with these new M1 machines, the scalability comes from simply adding new cores since at its core, it still is an M1 chip based on the A14 architecture. With more cores to compute and more transistors to process instructions, memory bandwidth of 200GB per second and 400GB per second are possible since each of their memory chips has a few 120-bit LPDDR5 interfaces. So look, multi-threaded performance is great, but when it comes to single core utilization, it won't be as different as what we have in the M1. Great for video editors and content creators, but for software engineers, it's a whole other story. Now, this whole week I've been regularly taking iOS development classes and trying to dive back into building full-stack mobile apps, to the point that I wiped the 14-inch completely and only installed development tools, nothing else. Look, honestly, as a part-time programmer and an iOS developer enthusiast, the M1 Pro vs the M1 Max debate shouldn't even be a question. Already as it is, the M1 is basically overkill for 90% of development tools that are CPU based. But the thing is that the M1 Pro does bring something new to the table and that is the fact that you can now have dual screen support. So if you want support for up to two 6K monitors at 60Hz, as well as take advantage of the new mini LED XDR display, the new M1 Pro chip is a go-to, which also seems to dynamically allocate 120Hz while using code editors. As a developer, this is nice and all, but it's important to take a look at the laptop as a whole. First, I think a 16GB spec can be more than enough, but 32GB wouldn't hurt to future-proof yourself. Regardless of that, already the 8GB unified memories from the 13-inch laptops were really good. It mostly has to do with the fact that regardless of the RISC architecture, it accesses memory and computes processes really well. I would be impressed that for things such as web development, you would run out of memory. Also, I can argue that 512GB of storage is enough, but if you happen to work on large Xcode projects for example, some projects take up to 3MB and others up to 13GB. It just overall depends on the specific projects you are working on, so 1TB could maybe come useful here. The 14-inch with 8 CPU cores and 14 GPU cores is already plenty for a base model. My only recommendation is that if you are thinking of sticking with web development, don't look further. Otherwise, I think the second tier of the 14-inch is a really attractive choice for iOS developers. But look, regardless of this, you should mainly be focused on whether or not you should opt for the 14 or 16-inch, because to be honest, there's so much more wobble on the bigger format. Now, that's not the only reason as to why I decided to review this particular laptop. For me, this is the perfect laptop for software engineers. With a 14.2 inch screen, we are not too far from the 15.2 inch screen we had in the past. It's a lot lighter than the 16 inch, it has the advantage that it will fit better in most backpacks and if you are a traveler, the chances are that on a plane it will be so much more comfortable to work with. But there are key differences and it mostly has to do with the fact that the chassis itself is smaller. So the content surrounding the notch is affected by it if companies don't optimize their apps by the use of the safe area API. You might also be running out of runway when drag and dropping files with this trackpad and the speakers do sound a tad different. But that doesn't matter because either way, most developers like using their keyboard to travel through code, 90% of us are introverts so we keep to ourselves with headphones and I never really ran into many bar problems with this machine when learning iOS development, but that doesn't mean that it can't be a thing. 
Regardless, if I were you, I wouldn't focus too much on battery life because a full charge for me when working with Xcode, VS Code, and a bunch of Stack Overflow tabs open lasted for about 12 hours in total for me. Truthfully guys, the whole week I've spent so many hours getting back into Swift, trying to relearn storyboards to eventually detach to Swift UI, and even doing some awesome things like working on a Node.js server hosted on a VPS. Which by the way, I used a Linux VM to connect to it. And as a whole, my development experience so far has been great. But there's so much more to this machine than talking hardware, because this week I came across some interesting dev tests while learning new technologies. However, if you are like me and you find it best to follow a structured curriculum to learn how to code, I suggest you check out Coding Dojo. Coding Dojo is a global technology education company that offers three full stack coding bootcamps. Whether you want to learn the leading industry Python tools, their full Java stack to eventually work in things such as server apps at the financial services, or even learn Mern to create awesome e commerce websites, Coding Dojo can allow you to maximize your career opportunities and have the chance to dive deep into software development, data science, and even cybersecurity. Their curriculum is very well designed to make this your first and last bootcamp you'll ever attend so you can start tackling projects and truthfully learn even more by doing it. If it's of interest to you, you can download their course back and check out exactly what you will be learning. I did personally attend their online session and had access to multiple of their classes. They deliver hands-on and structured teaching which will help you develop your coding skills a lot quicker and I honestly thought the online learning experience was far superior from when I was attending my computer science classes online at university. Don't worry though, if you can't attend full time, you also have the ability to do it part time if it's a career change you're thinking of. Plus, after graduation, Coding Dojo ensures they are always there for you by being able to reach out to your career service managers again to reorient you and find the most suitable career in the industry. Look, I've learned by doing, but I've also realized you need the proper guidance to grow into self-sufficiency so you can learn how to be a developer. I just thought it would be really cool to include Coding Dojo within this review because I know a lot of you guys are seeking to work at Fang, start your own startup, or simply thinking of a career change. I truthfully hope this helps and you can always check Coding Dojo's YouTube channel and subscribe to them. By the way, if I wasn't so invested in the media business, I'd be working as an iOS developer for sure. Which is why for me testing Xcode on this new MacBook is essential. Up to now, even though I've been dealing with fairly easy projects, the program runs so well. It compiles so quickly, I am able to run multiple simulators without a problem, and it never freezes on me like it used to in the past. But I wanted to push this thing a lot more, and so I looked for solutions online, and Alexander Siskin pointed me in the right direction. Turns out, MaxDeck created a large codebase to measure compilation time in Xcode. In other words, a framework that includes 42 popular Cocoa Pods libraries and more than 70 dependencies in total, making this project's file size a total of 632.2 megabytes. However, because we are programmers, I decided to git clone the project. And so I followed the instructions by disconnecting from the Wi-Fi, emptying the list of all software running at startup, tweaking the battery to the right settings, and rebooting my Mac. With the machine plugged in, I finally decided to run the test to see where we would stand in the leaderboards. With results of 100 seconds to build the entire project, with such specs, we were pretty much standing within the top 3 of the leaderboard. A couple of places up from the 13 inch MacBook Pro M1 which I then decided to test for myself as well. And we got very similar results to the table provided both machines were at 16GB of RAM, but I wanted to take it to another level and so I cloned the rendering engine within Safari, WebKit which took about 10 minutes to download due to the fact that it is a 12.3 gigabyte project, so I eventually ran the build test with the time command and waited. So the entirety of this build took about 15 minutes to build, with peak temperatures of about 97 degrees for the CPU and 39 degrees for the surface, with loud fans of course. Now, when I'm not coding front-end, I'm most likely coding and learning back-end, but for this, I do use VS Code. VS Code is a lightweight source code editor, so running it on any machine will do fine. The only thing I would say that if you aren't coding on the 16 inch model, you'll definitely lose some space and baked HTML files for example will be tighter. But to be honest, it's really not that bad because the chances are your VS Code settings properly wrap. However, when it comes to development, Safari is definitely not a go-to. I personally use Chrome and when I created my ReactJS Ecom website, I use Chrome a lot since it has a great element inspector for the DOM, which made me think how could I benchmark such an app written in JavaScript. 
while speedometer simulates user actions for adding, completing, and removing to-do items using multiple examples in to-do MVC, which is awesome because it uses popular frameworks such as React, AngularJS, Vue.js, and so on. So I actually ran the test on the 13 inch and on this machine. With scores quite different from what I was expecting, this clearly shows that for web development, you don't need the superior laptop. Although if you are a Docker person, well, I decided to take my backend project and contain it. So with my VS Code project, I created a Docker file with some settings exposing the port 8080 and running the app.js command, which by the way, is a simple server with some endpoints that stores data on the MongoDB database I created. So I ran Docker Builder Prune to make sure we are fully clean and started building the container project. With 24 seconds to build this image, it really wasn't too far off the M113 inch. By the way, I did have this whole server running on DigitalOcean, but because it was already all set up, I decided to use my old VPS from Hostinger to deploy this. And so for fun, I went ahead and installed Parallels along Ubuntu in order to have a VM that could take care of my SSH connection with my server. It took me a good hour to figure out again how to redeploy a Node.js app to a server, but we eventually figured it out. I wasn't too surprised at the fact that Ubuntu almost felt like it was running natively while doing all these commands. The browser ran well while I was setting up my VPS, all the animations within the OS worked fine, and I never experienced any hiccups while using the terminal to SSH, install Nginx, and configure some parameter files with Nano. Regardless, I had an enjoyable development experience deploying this project using a VM. Going back to VS Code on macOS, I did install the Python extension to run projects because like my last M1 Mac Mini review for programmers, I wanted to show you the temperatures this thing produced while running the Mandelbrot algorithm on this machine. And keep in mind, this test stresses the CPU to see how powerful it is. So during the test, we saw temperatures of 106 degrees for the CPU with the fans kicking in and surface temperatures of 31 degrees. And with execution times of a minute, we don't see any gains in terms of CPU power for this test compared to the M1 Mac Mini. Oh, and for my 6-core VM using Ubuntu, we ran the same test delivering a total execution time of 2 minutes and 36 seconds. Not bad M1. But I wanted to go back to macOS to install Anaconda so I could run an auto encoder. So I created my Conda environment, installed all the packages needed according to the TensorFlow documentation, pasted the code to run the project based on 10 images, and it took 2 minutes and 28 seconds for the neural network to reconstruct these images that were given as an input. As for Java, I went ahead and installed it from the Oracle website, which comes with included universal binaries. IntelliJ is now supported on M1 and last time I tested it, it ran well. But this time, I wanted to see how fast we could build a fairly large project. So I found a Java build benchmark by Sergio Del Almo and I went ahead and cloned it. Now, downloading Rattle for the first time and updating indexes took quite a bit of time. Even while updating indexes, I was going through the project and it lagged a lot. But look, this is normal even on my main machine. Also, IntelliJ uses the Safe Area API to take care of the menu bar so with this 14-inch laptop, I didn't have any issues with such a program. I did try to run the Micronaut service, but sadly, it was unsuccessful since I was not authenticated with the server. I did check the repo and they seem to have changed a few things. But look, honestly, comparing it to the Intel-based IDE, it is so much quicker and smoother. Your Java projects will run completely fine. In my opinion, the MacBook Pro 14 inch is more than capable for developers. It's honestly overkill by the fact that you get the ability to run two monitors. It's just very hard to deny the fact that this could be the perfect laptop for developers. I hope these tests as well as my experience as a dev with this laptop helps you guys. Hopefully it allows you to make the right decision on whether or not you should get it. Stay tuned on the second market as people will be trading their M1s for this. Maybe you can catch a deal. I have to get going, I have a few accessories for next week's video, I will see you all then, take care. Thank you Coding Dojo for sponsoring this video and allowing us to make cool content.